Well, if my engine was suffering from flooding, one of the first things I'd check is the air filter. This air filter's blocked, so there's less airflow allowed through. Now the trouble with that is, because there's too little air coming through here, there's too little there to atomize this fuel. So this fuel goes in there in too high a concentrated amounts. And so ultimately when this engine is doing its business, there's a lot of fuel compared to air going to the top of the piston. And what will happen there ultimately when the piston goes right up to compress everything, it's in there is liquid. And as we know, liquid petrol doesn't actually ignite. That, of course, will wet the spark plug and stop the firing of the spark plug. And, of course, ultimately, this is what flooding is. So in this case, it's a case of either having a new air filter or if it's a cleanable, serviceable one, it's removing it and giving it a good clean out. And number two, choke. So the next thing I'd look for is, is the choke stuck on. This is the choke butterfly here. And, of course, that opens and closes. Obviously, from a cold start, we want it closed because we want a lot of fuel into the engine just to get things moving. But if it's stuck shut like this, if we try and start it too many times with it shut, or if it closes during operation, then the same thing will happen as a blocked air filter. Less air will be able to come through and then what would happen, we'd have the same problem again with the flooding. So we'd just make sure everything's okay there with the choke, make sure that's not stuck on. And number three, mixture screws. Is the fuel-air mixture settings right? If the mixture screw is screwed too far out, it will allow too much fuel to come down here and out into the inlet. Even though there's enough air coming through, and regardless of this, if there's too much fuel allowed through there, then we're going to get the same problem there. We're going to get flooding. And so number four, spark. We can see here that all's working correctly. We've got a good flow of air coming through, mixing with fuel, everything's going. The fuel and air mixture is being compressed up there nicely and there's a good atomization of fuel there, so a good air to fuel ratio there. So all's looking well. Now although everything is well and atomization's well there, if there's an insufficient spark, if the spark plug is starting to show its age or there's a problem with the spark where it's not sparking quite right, then combustion can't take place properly. And ultimately what's going to happen there, there's going to start being a build-up of fuel there all in this area really, even though there is air coming in with the fuel, the fuel's gonna build up. And then we've got a problem with the fuel becoming more of a liquid in there then, rather than atomized. And so this is causing the flooding. And it's the same if this spark plug isn't sparking at all. If we try to start an engine and the spark plug isn't actually sparking at all, then we're gonna get this problem again. And of course, if it's not sparking, it's not gonna start anyway. Now number five, oil fuel mixture. If you can see, I've just illustrated the fuel now as dark. And what I'm trying to say by that is that there's too much oil in with the fuel. So now what we've got is a good amount of airflow and we've got the air coming in nicely. Everything's open. We're dragging in fuel. Everything's working. But the problem is now that because there's so much oil, it's making it difficult for the engine to combust the fuel that it's mixed with. The reason we put two-stroke oil in the recommended ratios that we do, like 50 to 1 or uh, 30 to 1, whatever the manufacturer recommends, is to retain high enough levels of petrol to combust properly. So that's the right mixture. Now, if we put too much oil in there, oil obviously doesn't combust like petrol. So what's going to start happening there? Well, we're going to start getting black smoke for a start. We're going to get incomplete combustion. It's going to create more waste. And also what's going to happen there, because it's not combusting properly, there's going to be a buildup. It's going to start wetting this plug. And number six, needle valve. So if we could have x-ray vision and look down there at the needle valve, we'd see this, we'd see the lever the spring and this is the needle there that can move up and down and that goes downwards like that and sits on its seat. The fuel comes up this way. That diaphragm there is this metering diaphragm here that pushes back on the lever to allow it to do this. So if everything's working normally and no fuel is being used by the engine, the needle valve will be on its seat because this spring is pushing up on the lever at the back, pushing the needle valve down. And the needle valve is fast on its seat and no fuel can escape into this area and escape into the engine area. The diaphragm, the metering diaphragm is up, so there's nothing pushing down on it at this point. That's this view of the carburetor.
Now when the engine's running and this carburettor's in its working state, fuel's coming through and the movement of the piston is driving the fuel pump diaphragm up and down, creating the pressure that way. So there's a pressure under the needle valve ready, but because the engine's using fuel, it's using fuel out of this area, drawing it out, making a vacuum there for that diaphragm, which is pulling the diaphragm down, pulling the lever down, opening the needle valve, allowing this pressurised fuel to keep going up and through. So that's the working operation, it's doing this. Some of the main problems I've found with flooding and needle valves is normally this lever set too high. Any movement of this diaphragm, even slight, it'll move this needle valve off its seat too soon. We can see there just a slight movement of that diaphragm has been enough to make a quite a big gap there to allow lots of fuel into this area, more than it should do in its correct operation. And that, as I say, can lead to flooding. But that's easily rectifiable. It's a case of removing the diaphragm, holding down on this bit, whilst depressing down on that there, just to get the right level. And the right level, the height there, is generally set to the same height as this area. So we can get a straight edge across there, put it across from one side to the other, and we can see there that's set correctly, because the back of the lever there is touching the ruler. So that's right. Another issue I've had in the past is the wrong metering diaphragm. Everything looks right from the shape perspective. I've had them where they fit on. No problem whatsoever with the holes correct. But on the underside here, with the area that meets with the lever, that's been too long. Because there's so many different types of diaphragm out there, it's quite easy that, especially if you're buying something second hand of course, that someone might have had the carburetor stripped, tried to repair it and put a diaphragm in that looks right, but there are varying lengths of these. And of course, if they're too long, we're back to this issue here. Any small movement in the diaphragm is going to open the floodgates, if you like, way too early, leading to flooding. Another problem with the issue of needle valves I've had in the past as well is damaged seats. If the seat's damaged, it doesn't matter how good everything is here, if the lever's working well, the diaphragm's well, the dowel's well, the spring's well, and the needle's well, if the seat is damaged, it's going to leak past regarding needle valves and seats. If we look at these two here, we can see that on this one, we've got this area here that usually represents the metal part of the valve. And we've got this part here. This is normally like a rubber and it beds into the seat there to create a good seal. Sometimes the needle valves are all metal or a hardened substance and it's the actual part on the seat that's the softer substance to allow for good seating. And when it comes to seat damage, it's generally the softer part, whether it be on the needle valve or whether it be on the seat, that either degrades or is damaged in some way. Fuel can come up and it can seat past both of these because of damage. Another seating issue there can come from the valve lever spring. If this spring is too weak, then it's not going to push up on that lever hard enough to push down hard enough with the needle valve onto its seat. Then the fuel pressure that comes up here can actually seep past into this area at times when it shouldn't do. And of course that can lead to flooding. Another issue relating to needle valves can be the wrong needle valve. As we can see there, this one's too small to create a seat. It's too thin. It's the wrong type. And I have seen this in carburettors that I've stripped down and had a look at in the past. Particularly when I've bought second-hand machines where they've been stripped down before and whoever's rebuilt them has mistakenly put in the wrong needle valve. And since then it's been flooding. So we need to keep a vigil out there to see if it's the right size needle valve that fits into this area. There is a very simple way of testing to see if needle valves are seating right. And the way I've always done it is, whilst there is a proper tool to do this, you can do it without it. And the way I do it is, when the carburetor's actually built up fully, like this, and the diaphragms are in, all the lids are on, and it's ready to put on the machine, what I've done in the past is, you can see the fuel pipe coming in there. I put a nice piece of clean fuel pipe on the inlet, and then I submerge the whole of the carburetor underwater and then we blow through the tube. And basically, if everything's seating okay there, no air will get past. But if it's not seating, and the air's allowed to get past the needle valve there, it'll actually seep into this area here, as does the fuel, and it'll come out the main jets, and then you'll see it there coming out as bubbles in the surface. Finally, number seven, fuel quality. Now, something that is a little bit more controversial, and something I have actually had problems with in the past, is the quality of fuel, and the lack of quality of which, that can lead to more insufficient combustion in the engine, and sometimes can lead to flooding. Now, I've only had this problem a few times, because I've always made sure I've got fresh fuel. 
what can happen is that when the fuel is stored for too long, the more volatile, the more combustible component of the fuel, it's more reactive and it evaporates into the atmosphere. And then what it leaves behind is a less combustible material. And trying to start the machine on this type of degraded fuel, if you like, just isn't very good and it doesn't combust as well, so it can lead to flooding. This needs throwing away. So at that, I just want to thank you so much for looking at my seven possible reasons that can cause flooding in a two-stroke. Thank you for watching.